Hi, I'm Ziang Xie, and I'll be talking about multimodal blending for high accuracy instance recognition. This is joint work with Arjun Singh, Justin Wang, Karthik Narayan, and Peter Beal at UC Berkeley. So, for a specific robot in a specific environment where there aren't that many objects, recognizing object instances may be sufficient for a wide range of tasks. And this gives us several advantages. Two major ones are that it allows us to collect rich data on the object instances beforehand, and it also allows us to perform a rigorous verification phase to determine whether we have the correct object hypothesis. There's been a number of prior work on this problem. Early work by David Lowe and collaborators, and more recently, the MOPED system by Colette et al. Both of these mostly focus on detecting objects in image space. There's also been a number of work by Dieter Fox and collaborators on RGBD object detection. More recently, there's also been several works on the data sets that we'll consider here. So Vascovicius et al., Singh et al., and Aldoma et al. Before going into our main contributions, I'll first give a brief system overview. Let's start with training. At training time, we have a number of object instances and we put each of these objects onto a training rig, such as a turntable with a fixed checkerboard. We use an RGBD sensor, such as the Microsoft Connect, to get an image and a point cloud for each view of the object. After passing these through our training framework, we obtain our object models, which consist of feature descriptors along with their associated 3D coordinates with respect to the object origin. We can train models for a number of feature types. So, for example, using texture features, shape features, or color features. At test time, we are given a point cloud and image of a number of objects atop a supporting plane. Our task is then to detect and estimate the pose of each object in the scene. Our segmentation algorithm is fairly standard, so I assume we have the individual object clusters in the scene. So, for each object hypothesis in our training set, we then run a pose recovery procedure. We take the feature correspondences between the test cluster and our training model, and we sample three of these correspondences in order to compute a transformation between the test cluster and the training model. Given that we have the test cluster aligned to our training model, we then determine an inlier account for the estimated transformation. So for each feature descriptor in the test cluster, we check whether its nearest neighbor lies within a small distance of it on the training model. If it does, we increment the inlier count. This gives us a way of ranking the different poses estimated by sampling the three points in order to get an alignment. Taking the best pose, that is the pose with the highest inlier count, we then run a pose verification process, which goes as follows. For each descriptor in the test cluster, we search within a small radius of it on the training model after the two have been aligned. We look for a feature descriptor on the training model which lies close in feature space to each of the test descriptors. If there is such a descriptor on the training model, we increment the pose verification score. This pose verification procedure allows us to do a rigorous comparison in order to check whether the test cluster matches the training model. Experimentally, we observed that dense feature extraction is crucial for high performance and we can use any number of different feature types. This leads us to our main contribution, which is an adaptive feature blending procedure in order to combine the scores we obtain using pose verification. So more feature types give us more information in order for us to determine the correct object. But the challenge is to determine which features are most relevant for a given test case. So I'll first try and motivate the need for different feature types. Here's one example test scene. There's two objects in the back here which are highly occluded. Since they're occluded, global descriptors such as those which describe the shape of an object might not work very well. But since there's a decent amount of texture on each object, SIF descriptors will work well. On the other hand, here's another case where we have a side view of a detergent bottle. There's relatively low texture, so SIF descriptors will not work very well. On the other hand, there's no occlusion, so shape descriptors might give us a good idea of what type of object this is. Finally, here's an example where we have six Adwala bottles. Only two of these Adwala bottles, however, are in our training set. 
The rest are what we call imposters and should not be declared as detections. In this case, we'll want to use color information in order to distinguish between the different types of Edwalla bottles. So as we saw from the previous example, we want a variety of feature types for different scenarios. So for example, texture, shape, and color features. And for each feature type, we obtain a feature score through our post-verification procedure. But now the question is, how do we combine the feature scores that we obtain? One simple method might just be to learn a weight vector w, such that for each object hypothesis, our combined score is just w transpose x, where x is our vector of feature scores. So, as an example, if we had sift, shape, and color feature scores, our weight vector might be 0 0.7, 0 0.2, and 0 0.1. We might handpick this according to the intuition that sift descriptors are more discriminative than shape descriptors, which in turn are more discriminative than color descriptors, which are just three element vectors in this case. So, for the example we saw before, this makes a good amount of sense, since sift descriptors should be reliable for this scene. On the other hand, in this case, sys descriptors are not reliable, but shape descriptors are. So a better weighting might be 0 0.1, 0 0.8, and 0 0.1, where we weight the shape score most highly. Finally, in this example, the sys scores and shape scores will be the same for almost all the objects. And we'll want to weight the color score most highly. So, as we can see, the problem with the previous approach is that it ignores the current scene and object hypothesis by setting one weight for all cases. Another problem is that it's not scalable. For the case where we only have three different feature types, we might be able to handpick a weighting which makes sense and works relatively well. But imagine if we had 100 feature types. That would no longer be feasible. So the idea is that we want to combine feature scores based on the current scene and object properties. We adopt the feature-weighted linear stacking approach of SIL et al. Here, weights which combine feature scores are linear combinations of meta-features computed on the current scene and object hypothesis. To make this more concrete, let me give a few examples. One meta-feature might be the median color saturation of a test image segment. This gives us some idea of how reliable our color features will be. Another meta-feature might be the median gradient of the test image segment, which tells us how much texture there is, which lets us know how reliable our SIF features will be. One other meta-feature might be a measure of how occluded the object is, since this tells us a lot about how reliable the shape features will be. So as a toy example, let's look at the case where we have the side view of the detergent bottle. We'll only consider one meta-feature, which is the median gradient of the test segment, which here is rather low. And we'll assume we only have two feature scores based on SIF and shape descriptors. Now, Instead of previously using a fixed weight vector, 0 0.7, 0 0.3 for sift and shape, respectively, we now use a weight vector where the first weight is 0 0.7 times our meta feature, the median gradient, and our second weight is 0 0.3. In this case, if the gradient is small, our shape score is weighted more than the sift score as desired. So previously, for each object hypothesis, our combined score was just W transpose X, where X was the vector of the feature scores. Now we have meta features, where each meta feature is a function of the current test segment and object hypothesis. Our combined score is still a weighted combination of the different feature scores, except now each of our weights is a linear function of the meta features. We can equivalently express this as a matrix W of our weights times our vector of meta features and take the dot product of that with our vector of feature scores. So more concretely, here's an example where we have a set of four feature scores with an intercept term appended, and also a set of three meta features. We take the pairwise product between our feature scores and our meta features in order to obtain our final feature vector, which we call phi of x. Now our final score is w transpose phi of x. Rearranging some terms and expanding some vector products, we can see that this is equivalent to our combined score described previously. We learn our weight vector w using a standard ranking SVM formulation, where we minimize the normal w plus the sum of our slack variables, subject to the constraint that for each training example, w transpose, the final feature vector for the correct object, is greater than or equal to w transpose, the feature vector, for all our other object hypotheses, by at least 1 minus the slack. 
We generate 10,000 object views with simulated occlusions using our training data in order to learn W. Now, on to results. We first consider a single object recognition task. Here, there is only a single object in each scene. Note that our blending approach gives perfect performance on this task. Now we move on to the challenge dataset, which was one of two datasets introduced as part of the 2011 Solutions in Perception Challenge held at ICRA. Tang et al., who were the winners of the challenge, obtained an F-score of 0.9429. F-score is just a harmonic mean of the precision and recall. Maldomo et al. recently brought this up to 0.9977. Our approach allows us to get 0.9988. So as you can see, this data set is more or less saturated. And this is mostly due to the lack of occlusions in the test scene. Here is our one missing detection, a relatively specular Gillette bottle. Now we consider the Willow dataset, which is the other dataset introduced as part of the 2011 challenge. The Willow dataset is much more difficult due to heavy occlusions, sometimes even full occlusions, as well as imposter objects, such as the different flavor of Walla bottles we previously saw. Tang et al. obtained an F-score of 0.749. Aldoma et al. brought this up to 0.8092, and our approach obtains an F-score of 0.9273. So we can see our approach works significantly better for this data set with the occlusions and imposters, which is what originally motivated our multimodal blending approach. In summary, we present a state-of-the-art method for instance recognition, which obtains 4% better precision and 17% better recall than the next best result on the Willow data set. Key components include dense feature extraction, leveraging multimodal features to exploit different cues for different scenes, and a method for blending the feature scores in a data-driven way. For supplementary material, including visualizations of all our detections as well as some dataset annotations, please refer to the following URL.